One of the things I learned recently from an Australian friend of ours that um, uh, in a research conducted by the University of New South Wales, uh, they found that PowerPoints are really not very helpful because human beings can either see or he uh, hear. They cannot do both. Um, <laughs> so, but, so what I have is not these jumping about animations, but rather simple points which I'll be blanking out from time to time so that you can listen and not see. And uh, I hope to make my points with power, hopefully, <laughs> whether I use PowerPoints or not. Uh, essentially, as uh, Suichi rightly pointed out, it's good for us to begin to see that uh, this particular commandment comes to us with an interesting linguistic twist. Uh, let's turn to... Can you see? Mark, yeah, of course I can see, but whether they can see me is the issue. <laughs> Tim, I think really this is not the most important thing. I think I am the most important thing. <laughs> You know, I, I learned this uh, characteristic lack of modesty uh, from Paul, and so you can forgive me for that. Uh, I want you to turn to Mark 12.30, and um, we, when we talk about engaging the mind, uh, we should look at a very interesting way in which Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, when this lawyer asks him, what is the greatest commandment? And if you look at Deuteronomy 6, 5, uh, from the Hebrew it's translated as, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. But if you check the Hebrew, the word is really not strength. It's a very peculiar usage, uh, seen only twice in the Old Testament. Uh, it's heart, um, soul, and very, V-R-Y, with all your very. Now, that will be bad English, but apparently it's not bad Hebrew. Uh, you see that once again only in uh, Second Kings 23, 25, I think, where it is uh, said about Josiah. Uh, there is uh, no king who arose like Josiah who loved his Lord with all his heart, soul, and very. Now, in the English, the word me'od is the Hebrew, and in English, uh, the word used is strength. But when Jesus quotes this, and of course, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, but the Gospels are written in Greek, and so there are a number of transpositions here. You see that in Mark 12, 30, there is a very important addition. Probably the word very is translated as mind as well as a strength because the words for heart and soul are fairly correctly translated or represented in the Greek. But uh, mind and strength cannot really be located in the Hebrew. Uh, I do want to make a comment here. What could have been one of the reasons why uh, the Greek writers of the Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, Mark thought of using the word uh, dianoia, uh, which comes from, uh, you know, dianoetic is uh, an English uh, adjective which we don't normally use. It is used for discursive reasoning, where you sit and um, discuss in opposition to intuitive reasoning. Both have important part in our lives, but this is about discursive reasoning, where we, when we engage the public square, we need to give the basis of why we draw certain conclusions, not simply God has said this. I will address that point when we engage the public square. How do we articulate the truth of God uh, as uh, relevant to the secular world? Uh, so I think uh, one of the good examples from recent times is um, the issue of, uh, of Judas Gospel. If uh, you had watched that series on the National Geographic Channel, or I think one issue of National Geographic, March last year, I think, was devoted to Judas Gospel, about whose existence we were aware from the writings of an early uh, Christian bishop, Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon. But we did not have the Gospel till we discovered the fragments of it about 30, 40 years ago, and scholars put it together. Now you can buy it for 50 Singapore dollars, the English translation, very expensive, uh, but it's not complete. It has got gaps. And you will notice that when the gospel began to spread 
through the Roman world of the first century. It encountered Gnostic philosophy. And so Christians, when they came to believe in Christ, also had to come to believe in a mental appreciation of the truth of God so that they could address issues coming out of uh, their own times. And when we come to this time, as Timothy rightly pointed out, we need to be able to use the mind both to be nourished by the truth of God as well as to be able to speak to the world outside. Now, when Simon Chia, our um, secretary of GCF, circulated the hymns, he had only three stanzas to the Church's One Foundation. I typed in the two extra uh, stanzas only to nourish our mind with truth. We don't sing five stanzas these days. We sing one line five times. Uh, I have not fully understood that. I'm not against it, but I feel one of the reasons why we do not find ourselves being nourished by the truth of God is uh, our general uh, lack of uh, Bible knowledge as well as our complete throwing out of hymns. Uh, my own theological upbringing was not by going to a Bible college, but uh, I ran into a, an essay of uh, Toza when I came to Christ as a college student from an Anglican background. And he said, after your Bible, if you read the hymns of Watts and Wesley, you'll be a good theologian. So uh, I was brought up in that. Of course, this is a, a song written by Samuel Stone and set to music by Samuel Wesley, who's probably one of the sons of the Wesley brothers, which one I'm not very sure. But the uh, tune to which we sung it, 19th century hymn and tune, and uh, the whole understanding of how we are founded on Christ, we are looking forward to something, we go through heresies, schisms, and everything, but we look forward to the glorious consummation. I think that's the kind of stuff we need to nourish our minds on. It's not kind of a uh, psycho babble. It is something which is founded on the truth of who God is, and I think we have the privilege of uh, 2,000 years of church history. So that is one aspect of nourishing the mind. Secondly, we also need to see uh, that Satan's strategy is actually blinding the minds. Second Corinthians 4 verse 4. I've given the Bible verses in the notes. Um, and I think this is important because there is a general suspicion of the Christian community in the marketplace that we are those who have actually stopped thinking and started believing. And Richard Dawkins, of course, waxes eloquent on this. The whole idea that thinking and believing are contrary to each other is not an idea of ancient times. It is, in fact, if you go back to this history of this particular thought, it's not more than 50 years old. And, in fact, I'm, one of the sad things about people like Richard Dawkins, I mean, he was holding the uh, position of uh, professor of public understanding of science, which is a pretty dangerous title for a person like him to hold, because his uh, view of understanding of where religion and stands uh, in uh, conjunction with science, what is the contribution of Christianity to uh, the founding and discoveries of modern science, I mean, it's totally absent in his writing, uh, which is, I think, uh, and many, many other secular writers who are much better informed than Richard Dawkins on this have said this. Now, I'm saying this from this particular, let me read that verse to you. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4 of Second Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And if Satan had thought that people by thinking will go away from God, he would have opened their minds. But he knew that thinking will not lead you away from God. To be sure, thinking alone will not lead you to God, because in that case, revelation would not have been necessary. But I think one of the things we must know, and this is extremely pertinent for our topic today, that when you critique the culture of the world around you, we, you really need to be able to train your mind. And there is nothing greater than God's revelation. And it's amazing diversity in the Bible, which gives you the basic tools on how to really get our minds to think rightly. So we love God with all our minds. We notice the strategy of Satan that it blinds the minds of people. And those who think that Christians are anti-intellectual 
uh, are absolutely on the wrong. And probably the Christian church is to be blamed at least for part of that suspicion. Because we have given the impression that in order to believe, you should stop thinking. In our own ministry of apologetics, basically, uh, we quote this verse to show that uh, thinking is what distinguishes justified belief from superstition. What you can believe and what you should not believe. So there is a difference between right belief and wrong belief. But uh, in the, our context for today, we begin to use our minds to critique and the, the world. Now, Romans 12, verse 2, when Paul says, if you look at verses 1 and 2 together of Romans 12, uh, it's a very familiar passage. Present your bodies is a verse 1, which is an active voice imperative you have to do. But verse 2 is a passive imperative. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means this is not a transformation that you can effect yourself but you need to allow your mind to be transformed by the Spirit. Because I think that is exactly where we have a problem with Christians, because we do not quite see, and if you really look at the context, this comes in the context of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, and I know that with the rise of the charismatic movement, we do have uh, uh, quite a lot of lectures on uh, the various manifestations of the Spirit. But some it's uh, somewhat sad that the charismatic movement has spawned a downside which seems almost to indicate that the work of the Spirit and the work of the mind are contrary to each other. Uh, that's really patently untrue. Uh, because, uh, in, in fact, even Paul in that tension in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, what will I do then? I will sing in the Spirit and I will also sing with my mind. Uh, I will pray in the Spirit and I will also pray with my mind. I think uh, we need to begin to see the importance of how uh, within the work of the Holy Spirit, the mind has a central part. And it is only by the transformation of the mind we begin to understand the values of uh, what the biblical worldview is all about. Brian will uh, later today, am I right? Uh, be speaking on world views, and I would be referring in passing because mine is a more general lecture. But I want you to see that our minds have to be in good shape. And, um, and that is why I think the Graduates Christian Fellowship also joined us uh, in this, or I, we joined them in this project. I mean, that's a better way of putting it. So you uh, need a renewed mind. And let me uh, frankly tell you, because this point which I'm making and the next one are related, because a renewed mind also is a renewed set of moral values. Now, many years ago when... Um, uh, I quit the government of India and joined uh, Rabbi Zakaria's ministries. One of my well-meaning Christian friends said, LT, you have made a sacrifice. Now, why did he make that statement? He made a quick arithmetic calculation. This is the salary that LT was receiving as chief engineer. This is the salary which uh, Rabbi Zakaria's ministry will pay him. The difference is the sacrifice. When you make such arithmetic calculations, it's quite obvious that your arithmetic is not converted. Uh, so we, c we can have our minds converted. Uh, in fact, one of the, an Australian doctor's good friend of both of us into our home, and uh, now lives in retirement in Brisbane. Uh, Frank Garlick uh, once made a statement to us young Christians. He said, we have accepted Christ in our hearts and secularism in our heads. In other words, our values have not been changed. How do we evaluate anything? How do we say a Christian meeting is a success? Is it by the number of people who attend? Or by the content of what we uh, talk about? So our whole value system have to undergo a change. But that takes me straight on to the um, important aspects of continuous character transformation. And in fact, I think one of the things uh, Tim said in his uh, welcome speech, uh, we have to speak to the public square. And this is a point I'm going to make again, but I'll run ahead of myself here. Uh, we have to make as contrite sinners that we are also a work in progress, that we are not speaking into the square as if we are finished products. And for that, this work of transformation has to be seen and experienced in the Christian community as an ongoing uh, factor. And I want to read to you, first of all, um, 
a verse which is not in your notes. Uh, this is Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27. Paul makes an interesting point. All his important points he makes only in the course of digressions, uh, which is an unfortunate trait of Paul, um, which I think those of us who are familiar with his writings would know. Verse 26, in your anger, or better still, be angry, or get zesta, be continuously angry about all that is wrong, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. That means, when I carry on a certain attitude, even a right attitude of anger, when I let it prevail or continue beyond sunset, which means that when it becomes a way of my thinking, I will begin to give a, a topos, a place for the devil, an opportunity for the devil. And you know, that is how the devil makes footholds into strongholds. That is a certain way of thinking, a certain way of speaking, becomes so much part of my life that even reflexively, I fall into certain wrong patterns of thinking eventually to habit. Uh, Proverbs 4.18 is another verse. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Because your behavior is fashioned by your thinking. So when we are talking about the mind, this is one of the things we need to make very clear. We are not just talking about some celebration like Suichi rightly said. This is not just about a some kind of an intellectual gymnastics. This is about how our moral behavior is affected by the way we harbor certain attitudes. Also, by the way we generalize. For example, from an Indian context, when a Christian makes the statement in the context of India, says, all Hindus are idol worshippers, it's not a true statement. There are many Hindus who do worship idols, but who are seeking a reality beyond the idol. How can I ever generalize? So when I speak to therefore a Hindu, I have this unfortunate mindset which looks at him in a different way. I mean, the same thing when if you are talking to abortionists or uh, people who propagate a, lay, a gay lifestyle, whatever it is, whatever may be true of our context in the public square, we need to be sure that we do not put people into categories of thinking. Even in our relationships within the body of Christ, in our families, look at the wife and say, she always says this. You know, when a husband keeps saying that about the wife and the wife about the husband, you can make sure that they can never relate properly to each other because you are actually typecasting a person into a situation and which makes your own mind fall into a, a mold which is totally wrong. In fact, uh, the word that Paul uses in Romans 12 to do not fall into the mold of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what we are looking at therefore here is an ongoing process. One more verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now the Lord, this is a beautiful um, section you should read from verse 7 onwards to get the whole picture. Verse 18, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. And if you have the NIV, the footnote is contemplate the Lord's glory. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. And what Paul seems to be saying is that we, we do not have any veil that uh, like Moses had to have. And of course, Paul mixes metaphors back and forth them in such a somewhat confusing way. And he says that the old covenant, when it is read, the veil still covers your eyes. But now in the new covenant, we behold the Lord. And if you read the previous few verses, he uses the word Lord for both the Lord Jesus Christ as well as the Holy Spirit. And you'll have to see in the context of whom he's referring to. What he's obviously meaning is that as we read scripture, we are looking at the face of Jesus and his character is being made real to us by the work of the Spirit. And so whether you take the passive meaning of reflect or the middle meaning of contemplate, where you are also involved and God is doing something, I am involved in this. Uh, we are being transformed. Our minds are being transformed. So when we talk about loving God with all our minds, all of this is included. 
of course, I don't claim that this is an exhaustive treatment of the place of the mind, but uh, we must understand that this is required in response to God, in obedience to God, in engaging the public square. Even what Tim said about the whole issue of fear, fear from, in the Hebrew, will be afraid of, but fear of is being reverent towards. Uh, the word is the same, but used with two different prepositions to show that my whole attitude of the fear of God, a reverence for God, is what delivers me from the fear of things and people and ultimately of Satan himself. And so we become bold <coughs> in a real sense of the word. Now, let me move on to the second issue, and we will do a little bit of uh, celebration, which we cannot help, actually. Uh, don't uh, think that I don't, I'm apologizing for celebration. Apologetics is not about apologizing, by the way. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think the reason why, and this is exactly one of the things, when you get to engage the marketplace, let me put up my two points uh, together uh, so that we are able to see that when we as Christians, and I'm now talking not about religious people in general, but Christians in particular or, uh, in our group here today, is that we have two aspects to look at, and I'm going to just refer to one chapter of the Old Testament which has become my favorite in the past couple of years, uh, which is Leviticus 19. Uh, if you ever think, can anything good come out of Leviticus, please read <laughs> chapter 19. And you will notice that it's one of the great chapters of the Old Testament. Because it starts with the statement, be holy for I am holy, which, in, which means that uh, the ma moral categories which drive the Christian community are derived from the very character of God. I think that is central to us. Um, I was telling Brian the, uh, yesterday in a different context, and I will mention that again. In India, we have some very interesting uh, engagement with people in the public. We uh, invite friends from other faiths. We don't normally call them non-Christians because it's a very unfortunate way of defining a human being by what he is not rather than when saying what he is. So we use the phrase friend from other faith, speak on a common topic, and then um, answers questions from the floor. In the invitation itself, it would be stated clearly that the speaker will speak from a Christian perspective, but you will all be able to contribute your opinions and contradict the speaker uh, when you feel so. And one of the topics, this was some years ago, was, is God a religious subject? Now, I think when the opportunity is ripe, I think we should have an open forum like that. The whole um, uh, phobia of God uh, is uh, not a very good thing. And um, uh, we Christians have contributed to this confusion, which I should tell you that. Uh, that when we talk about God, and I'm sure when Brian speaks on worldviews, this will come through clearly. I am talking about what I remember presenting on that open forum. Is God not, uh, I didn't start with a Christian sense, I ended with a Christian understanding of God. But it started with a, a metaphysical, a philosophical necessity of God. Can I look at life without any transcendent framework? And we need to begin to engage people to think in the, uh, that way. But that's not my point under this particular subheading. Because when we as a Christian community uh, begin to look at the uh, problems of the marketplace, particularly the ethical problems of the marketplace, and I want to tell you that all problems ultimately will prove to be ethical. You know, if you see the financial meltdown of recent times, and I think it is so uh, interesting. I think it was uh, when the recession was just beginning in the U.S. at the end of last year, uh, the previous uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, in, in a Senate hearing made this astonishing confession. He said, um, my assumption that free markets are self-correcting was a fatal mistake. You know, that's interesting because you find that impersonal market forces cannot bring about the personal dimension of morality. Ultimately, for free market enterprise to succeed, you need to have a moral framework. Who provides that moral framework? Your standard, my standard, God's standard. See, we need to begin to 
uh, articulate issues of this kind. And when you read through Leviticus 19, I'm going to read a few uh, representative verses, you will notice that morality will have both individual as well as social dimensions. Look at the way uh, the Ten Commandments are worded. Now, because we now read English uh, in modern versions, we don't make a distinction between the first and the second person, you. It's you for singular and plural. I mean, first, uh, singular and plural of the second person, you. Uh, it is I, and it's you and you, whereas it was thou for singular, you for plural. If you look at the Ten Commandments, uh, it is all in the singular, thou shalt not. But it is not given to an individual. It is given to the whole community. Even that shows you that there are two aspects uh, related to the being of God, both the individual and the social. Every individual of the Israelite community was to obey every one of the commandments, but the community was to provide the framework where the commandments were obeyable. For example, if I were to address an abortion issue within the Christian community, I should not only tell women that they should carry babies to term, but I should also work towards the Christian community providing a social net where a woman will be encouraged to carry the baby to term. So, you see, you see the point, whether a, a social acceptance or suppose uh, financially uh, she is too poor to... Uh, maintain the baby and so on and so forth. So if I speak only one dimensionally, I am not really addressing the problem. I need to bring the two, and this is part of the very being of God. I think God being Trinity itself contributes to this idea that God is not just an individual, he is a being in relationship. And therefore, when he creates us for relationships, he is now asking us to develop that kind of a framework. So the church, therefore, becomes, and this is a point I will make a little later, when we talk about salt and light, the conscience of a nation. You know, tomorrow is your national day. 15th of August is our Independence Day in India. 31st of August is Malaysia's Merdeka Day. I don't know why the Brits gave us colonies independence in August. That's a, <laughs> that's a mystery I will probably investigate later. Summer, uh, summer was it? <laughs> Maybe. But um, I think as we look at uh, the whole issue of our societies in freedom, uh, and we are to be conscious of the nation, the salt and light, light of our societies, we need to begin to see that the church has to be more than just be speaking on issues. We have to be doing some things about these issues. And that is so central. I think here, from what I read, the Singapore government is definitely persuaded that the Christian community was not very much in favor of having the integrated resorts, and it is surely trying to prepare a kind of a social net uh, in case there would be uh, gambling addictions coming out of those casinos. Now, those are things to which the Christian community should be able to contribute. Now, let me come to a few verses here. In fact, you can... Pick verses at random. Let me take a verse at random, which is not in your notes. Uh, verse 10 of Leviticus 19. Do not go over your vineyard a second time to pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Verse 33, when an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens. Verse statement on human rights, long before uh, United Nations. I am the Lord your God. Verse 35, do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest in. You know, when I first, as in my earliest days when I was reading the Bible, in King James Version, because they said your English would improve. This is before I became a Christian. I've been reading King James Version from 1949, when I was six years old. Uh, now, you know the literature value of the King James Version. Uh, now, I thought, this is like, you know, our old headmasters. 
No, 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 please. I, I let me put this off. Um, I am the Lord, uh, sort of conjured up in my mind the picture of our old school headmasters who sat with that round ruler and when the, school, the class teacher sent you to the principal for special punishment, he would wrap you on your knuckles. You remember that? I think older people here would remember. And uh, I thought, I am the Lord means I'm sitting here watching you. The moment you break this, I'm going to give you a rap on your knuckles. But I think I have grown up enough to know that that I am the Lord is to be interpreted at least in two ways. One is verse 2 of Leviticus 19. This is my character. What is not in Leviticus 19 is the incarnation. That is, if I were a human being, I would behave exactly like this. God telling us humans made in his image. So what we are seeing here is something which is both individual and social. And I do want to mention something here. And we probably uh, keep it till later. Uh, so whenever you address, do not go in a one-handed way. Please be comprehensive. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to read out to you, it's there in your notes, a letter which I typed out at 4.46 on the morning of 19th July. My wife sometimes gets up and sees me at the computer when I cannot sleep. You know, on the 16th of July uh, of this year, last month, less than a month ago, the Delhi High Court set aside a uh, 143-year-old uh, English common law uh, criminalization of homosexuality. And of course, Christians in India went ballistic. And I wrote a calming letter, which I came to know interestingly, that uh, the pastor of the Assemblies of God Church in Hyderabad preached his entire sermon last Sunday, 2nd of August, from my letter. Uh, I didn't know. I have no copyright, of course, over any of these things. But um, I want to take you through that letter to show one way of engaging the marketplace. It's a letter written to a Christian think tank, which we put together in India some years ago, and uh, how we should address this. And I'll be very happy for that letter to fall into the hand of any anti-Christian lobby in India or anywhere else in the world. For us, for them to be able to see where Christians are coming from when we speak on any particular issue. Uh, because that will be uh, important for us to see. But let me make uh, one other point when it comes to uh, the gay issue, because I thought it will be good for us. I'm making a digression. It's not in your notes. But when you look at uh, sexuality, and um, I'm just looking at this magazine, First Things. Uh, have you heard of First Things? It is a predominantly Roman Catholic paper. His editor till recently was Richard. Would you just hold it up for them to see? FT.com. Uh, you can go and subscribe. It's got some of the finest thinking articles. And that's one, um, this is an August, September issue, is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, where um, uh, an American lawyer, a Christian, Richard Stith, he teaches law at the Valparaiso University in Indiana. And he, he refers to certain. Uh, secular studies on legalization of abortion and increased permissiveness in sexual behavior as a social phenomenon. How, once abortion became uh, free, how men no longer exercise control in their desire for sex, and therefore women are actually not being freed, they are actually under greater oppression. I mean, it's a beautiful study. Now, this is the kind of a language in which we need to become more proficient. And uh, we need to uh, take, as I would later say, I would have personally chosen a better phrase, but um, uh, Francis Schaeffer, who is my apologetics guru, I never met him, but uh, it was on his writings that I cut my teeth in apologetics. He uses the word co-belligerents. Now, belligerence is a rather offensive word to make noise. But I'm not talking about making noise, but people who would think along with us, although they may not share our worldview. When you engage the uh, marketplace, you must look for 
uh, the truth of God being reflected in a lot of secular writings. Because the truth of the Bible are not counterintuitive. You break a law, it immediately has social repercussions. And sensitive people around the world, regardless of their faith, uh, see this and they begin to speak on it. When we speak from a Christian view also, I will say this later, but I want to take up this issue because it has something to do with the individual and the social aspect of sexuality. Look at Genesis 1 verse 26. God says, let us make man singular in our image, in our likeness, and let them, plural, it should have been him, them, which means that in the man that God was thinking of was the man-woman combination. Which is why in verse 27 it says, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And then you go to the marriage verse, Genesis 2.24, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, they will be one flesh. What does this represent? The complementarity of the woman to the man represents the complementarity of Christ to God. Paul would say that. Those of us who suspect that Paul was a male chauvinist, when you accost him in the corridors of the new creation, uh, he will quote just one verse to you. 1 Corinthians 11.3 The head of the woman is man, the head of Christ is God. Just as Christ compliments God, the woman compliments the man. Just as Christ is begotten of the Father, the woman is taken out of the man. Just as Christ with God the Father is one God through the Holy Spirit, the wife with the husband is one flesh through her sexual union. And therefore homosexual physical relationship violates something sacred in the very being of God. And therefore do not start with Romans 1 or Sodom and Gomorrah, but you start with who God is. And why as humans... We are special because we are made in the image of God. Theological reflection is needed at every level uh, for the nourishment of our minds so that we can speak to societies, which is why now, even right here in this building, in a small meeting with um, some Muslim friends, we talked about the, the first thing I spoke was the Trinity. Because if that is what God is, that is the first thing we have to talk about. But how do we represent that to the marketplace, to people who believe differently, is really what we need to uh, prepare ourselves for. Now let me come for, uh, mention something about the salt-light metaphor uh, when it comes, that means how do we prepare ourselves as the church in order to speak to the public square? Uh, till what time do I go? Okay, you just raised some warning signals. Um, you know, if you look at Matthew five thirteen and 14, it is not in the imperative. I mean, I've preached sermons on this, I've heard sermons on this, but we normally think Jesus was saying, you should be salt and you should be light. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying, you are the salt of the earth. You know, the, the mood is indicative, not imperative. He's actually saying that that is the very nature of the Christian community. He's stating that in the plural, not as an individual. In other words, for the Christian community to be able to speak into the public square, there has to be a community kind of a reputation that you begin to build. My father-in-law, who was a, a medical doctor, Esther's dad, um, studied in India, remained in India for most of his life. I think the first time he went abroad was when he was probably 60 years old. Uh, he became the first Indian chairman of the Evangelical Fellowship of India, something similar to your EFOS here in Singapore. And um, he always tells me a very interesting story from the Indian independence movement, because we are all in the independence month of British colonies. Uh, let me give you this illustration. Uh, he thinks he, this man, K.T. Paul, was a Christian lawyer who headed a four-person Christian group at the Round Table Conference in London. Gandhi led the Hindu group with a vast majority of the Sikhs. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led the Muslim group, and of course there were Sikhs, Parsis as well. But the Christian group was probably the third largest, uh, four people led by K.T. Paul in London, and this was to talk with the British politicians about the independence of India. Uh, there was a quarrel between Gandhiji and Jinnah 
on the number of seats allotted to Hindus and Muslims. And you know what Mr. Katie Paul said? He stood up and made a statement like this. Silver and gold we have none, but we have four seats. We Christians in India will give up these four seats. You divide it among Hindus and Muslims. Let us get independence and go back. Do you understand? See, I want to tell you that if Indian constitution could have an article today, Article 27, which says every citizen of India is free to practice and propagate his faith, you do not see that in any secular democracy of Asia. It is because of the Christian reputation won by people like that. So, you know, there is a reputation that you build, even in a country where we are a very small minority. And that is essentially what we need to do when we read Matthew 5, 13 and 14. Uh, the reason why uh, Jesus talked about the, um, the community enterprise. So uh, if we have any agenda for calling this meeting, it is only to get this into our churches to know that as a Christian community, we need to begin to uh, exert a reputation and uh, not single out individuals, which is the tendency of the marketplace. And we must militate against That's why we should bear the reproach of any Christian who might have spoken rightly or wrongly and therefore receiving flack. Uh, it must affect the whole Christian community. But at the same time, it also helps the Christian community to begin to establish a, a reputation against the background of which we are able to speak uh, to the public square. Uh, I remember once again, I'm giving uh, some of my personal illustrations, you will pardon me. Um, in one part of India where I was working, we were, lived about nine cities in India in the course of my work. And an evangelist was in that town, was going to his own state, and he said, I'm going to preach against corruption in my state. And I want to refer to you as a government officer, an engineer, as an example of honesty. I said to him, I don't think you should do that. The moment you single out a Christian individual, whether for good or for ill, uh, we are making a basic mistake. We are saying the rest of them are scoundrels. Only this fellow is honest. Now, that is not what uh, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth actually means. Secondly, we must also see that the work of continuous transformation, I, I mentioned it again, and we have to constantly make this. All our discipleship programs should be to help us to see that we are in this as an ongoing uh, process, and it's not only a mental activity. It is a mental activity insofar as it is going to transform my attitude, my way of looking at the church, uh, looking at the world. And thirdly, humility without compromise. Dissolve and yet stand out. You know, Jesus was brilliant in his choice of the metaphors. Salt acts by dissolving. Light acts by standing outside of darkness. That is, when I engage the marketplace, there is a level at which I identify. But there is a level at which I stand out. You know, the problem with us Christians is that we stick out like sore thumbs. Uh, we, we are salt when we should be light, and we are light when we should be salt. I mean, we compromise on moral values, and we stick out like sore thumbs when we ought to be identifying with the passion and the, uh, and the pr problems of our societies. And I think that is why Jesus chose that. And uh, you, I, because I don't want to take too much of time on this, let me come to my last section, uh, which is the articulation of Christian answers. You know, clean hands lead to clear mind. You know, plenty of books have been written on management and decision making. I even ran into an interesting article written by an Indian bu bureaucrat, tongue in cheek, how not to take a decision. Because in Indian mythology, there are 32 directions. You know, we have four directions normally. These are 32 directions. And an Indian bureaucrat who doesn't want to take a decision can send a file in one of 32 directions. Okay. <laughs> Now, one of the problems with us um, in public service, like what I was, and those of you who have something to do, is that decision making becomes difficult only when the decision maker has a hidden agenda. 
when you have no hidden agenda, your decision becomes very quick. Uh, one of my officers, subordinate officers, the highest compliment he paid me is that uh, uh, Mr. LT decides as if he is pro-contractor. Now, that sounds a pretty dangerous compliment, but what he actually meant was, I'm so quick in deciding that a contractor is even willing to do dismantle one whole floor of concreting. If I say you remove it the next day, I come for inspection and say you have to redo it. There is something not right. Rather than keep him waiting for two months, waiting for him to grease my palm, and then allow him to proceed with substandard work. So the way we begin to act begins with what is on the inside. Clean hands contribute to a clear mind. Therefore, I have told my officers that your decision making, your managerial skills are ultimately moral skills. You take morality out of management, you have no management. And Stephen Covey's books, in my opinion, is only because they are so Bible-based that they have become so popular. So, please um, think. Now, the, whole, the uh, next point, clear mind should result in clear speech. You see, the whole problem is we have a muddled mind, therefore our speech is muddled. I, I feel that we should take a broom and have a good brainwashing inside our skulls because we are so woolly in our thinking that when our speaking is also woolly. I was once telling my Indian colleagues, our politicians have nothing to say and they say it so well. We have so much to say and we say it so poorly. I think speaking into the public, that's why, let me frankly tell you, we have got enough courses on public speaking, speaking skills. I'm not, I'm, I'm not against skills, but I think skills are being given too much importance. And the content of how you think, how you behave, and therefore how you communicate. You see, the whole issue here is this. So clear hands to clear mind, clear mind to clear speech. See, your... Um, the public space is not going to listen to muddled thinking. Uh, they would begin to say there is sense in what you say. Although I disagree with you, you know, in some of our open forums in India, people who came for the first time to our meeting were very noisy, Muslims, atheists. But they would invite other non-Christian friends for future meetings. Let's go here, you'll hear something sensible. You may not agree with what they are saying, but let's listen to this. Now that is the kind of an engagement that we uh, need to make. Thirdly, the truths of God are not counterintuitive. That's what I've given in your notes. There's a need for 21st century metaphors and parables. We need to constantly craft metaphors, and that's creativity, uh, Christian creativity at its best. When you speak to our, I was jokingly telling Brian the other day in the office, I said, you know, Brian, when I look at this, uh, the gay lifestyle, I don't see how gay lifestyle can go with an evolutionary philosophy of life. Because evolution is all about propagation of species. But uh, homosexuality is not going to propagate species. So something is wrong. Either one is wrong, the other is wrong, or both are wrong. I think so that's a metaphor. I'm not giving any answers. I'm just questioning. Socratic method. Just question. If this is true, can this be true? Get people to begin to think. Um, you know, you should get hold of, are Peter Kreeft's books available here? Have you seen? Yes. Are they available? SKS? Yes. Where did you see them? Yes. Peter Kreeft is a Boston College professor of philosophy. It's a Roman Catholic college. And uh, he is great for writing 21st century stories. Of course, late 20th century. Uh, Socrates meets Jesus is one, the unaborted Socrates. Socrates' conversation with a woman who wants to abort uh, the fetus, a doctor who advises that, and a psychoanalyst who says something. And Socrates doesn't refer to Bible or anything. He just asks questions and drives these fellows up the wall. Uh, quite interesting. <clears throat> and of course, it's uh, famous uh, between heaven and hell. On November 22, 1963, three famous men died. Uh, John F. Kennedy, Aldous Huxley, and C.S. Lewis. And they meet between heaven and hell and have a conversation. See, now, when you read books like that, Lewis, a Christian, uh, Kennedy, pictured as a hedonist, pleasure lover, Aldous Huxley as an atheist. See, you know, when you read these books, you see how people craft metaphors to speak into uh, various situations. I think we need to do that. Fourthly, we enlist friends from other faiths who hold a similar ethical position. 
When you begin to speak on certain issues, I'm sure on where is corruption. See, now uh, we, uh, we have Christians, we have joined uh, huge online groups in India, belonging to all faiths, no faith, who want to fight against the issue of corruption in, in India. I, I think we need to begin to see. And then, of course, we say why we fight against corruption, which is uh, definitely a specially Christian position. But as a social evil, we want to fight against it. Please uh, do this. Now, the, my last point is not in your notes. Employ humor, please. I, I'm ending with the same note as, um, uh, but I'm really being a bit lighthearted here. Because Jesus used a lot of humor. Did you know that? You know, in one of our uh, Christian rest houses in southern India, in Bangalore, there is a painting of Jesus throwing back his head and laughing. When I go to that place, I just look at that painting and I reflect on it. Of course, you don't have a description of him laughing out loud. You have descriptions of his rejoicing in the spirit. But let me take this simple example from Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, this paralytic is being lowered by four of his friends, right? Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven, and the theologians in the house are terribly upset. Okay. Now, Jesus says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up your head and walk, rise up your bed and walk? Uh, what is easier? We are so spiritual, you know, Christians, we say, you know, to say, rise, take up your bed and walk is easier. Now, that's a ridiculous answer. Because we are so spiritual, we say forgiveness of sins is more difficult than healing of sickness. But that's really not the point. Jesus was actually joking. Saying your sins uh, are forgiven is easier because it is not verifiable. Saying, rise, take up your bed is more difficult. It is verifiable. And Jesus is actually saying, I'll do the more difficult thing so that you will know that I have the authority to do the easier thing. Let's learn a, a bits of humor from the Bible. <laughs> I think it is important for us to, I'll tell you another interesting story. This was one of our open forums again in India. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, was Chief Postmaster General of uh, Gujarat Circle those days was there. He was a World Wildlife Fund enthusiast. And in my talk, at some point, I probably said humans are uh, in charge of the rest of creation or whatever, rest of nature. I would not use the word creation unless absolutely necessary and in the right context. Uh, he asked the question, he said, you know, we have now discovered that birds and animals have uh, sensations of pain and so on. Dogs indicate guilt when they do something wrong. How can you ever say humans are above the rest of nature? And those were the days when India had launched the first Project Tiger to save the tiger from extinction. And I said, let's refer to the Project Tiger. When I look at a tiger, I know that he can harm me, and still I feel I should protect him. But when the tiger looks at me, he considers me as potential lunch. Now, what accounts for the difference? I feel responsible for the tiger. The tiger doesn't feel responsible to me. What is this? This is Genesis 128. Uh, what I'm saying is that you can use a 20th century metaphor in order to communicate a bit of humor thrown in so that people are able to sit up and listen to what you have to say. Okay, let me just conclude by reading from this letter. It's there in your notes. I'll quickly read. And as a kind of a practical demonstration of how one could do this. This was written three days after the Delhi High Court decision. Uh, it's on the second part of your file. <coughs> this WinPro network is uh, our group. And this is what I had written. Uh, we need to get several things clear in this discussion of homosexuality. Number one, what the Delhi High Court has done is the decriminalization of homosexuality, and that should not surprise or shock us. Would you not be shocked if adultery is criminalized? We know that adultery and homosexuality are sins before God, but we do not expect secular governments to legislate Christian morality. 
that is the role for the Christian home and the Christian church. Let us not pass on to the state the responsibility that belongs to us as children of God. Now, I'm making a, a rather dangerous statement, but let me tell you why history is on my side when I write something like this. You take the first century church, the politics, the political powers, the Roman rulers were anti-Christian. The church is birthed in Jerusalem. The Jewish rulers are anti-Christian. So how did Christian morality now, today, came to be recognized throughout the world? Take bigamy. I mean, every civilized country in the world considers bigamy as punishable. You have to divorce a spouse before you marry another. Where did it come from? I want to tell you that this is what is called the salt light influence, what has been seen. So when I'm saying this, I'm not at all for a moment suggesting that we should uh, persuade the Singapore government or Indian government or Malaysian government to legislate laws which will be good for society because they are based on Christian principles. Surely we can do that. But we should not press the panic button every time a Christian, uh, a secular government passes laws, liberalizes abortion, things like that. See, we become conscious of the nation only within that contrast, and that I want you to uh, recognize that. Secondly, we become particularly hysterical when we speak against homosexuality. Why is that? You know, nobody is going to listen to a history, let me tell you. We need to speak sanely and solemnly to our society. We need to speak comprehensively against all sexual misdemeanor, including homosexuality, adultery, premarital and extramarital affairs, divorce, as moral deviations from what God prescribed for us. When you single out homosexuality for special attack, you are giving the world the impression that other disorders in this area are better than homosexuality. Do you think that is right? You cannot expect the world to listen to the church when we double speak in this way. Thirdly, Christians should minister to homosexuals as we are called to minister to all sections of society. We do not at all encourage the lifestyle of the homosexual, but we should not develop a special type of hatred for them, homophobia. It is good to understand what the Delhi High Court has said in terms of human rights. The court is not totally wrong. I, as a Christian, understand from that judgment that I should treat a homosexual with respect as a human being made in the image of God. Well, I should have understood that from Genesis 1, long before any court in the world started speaking out on human rights. Number four, Biji George is a good friend of ours. He wrote an article on whether... Um, homosexuality was hardwired into our genes and recently we had another circular from the GCF friends on that issue. But what I've said here, this was before the, Biju wrote this before, this was complete, the Human Genome Project was completed. Our understanding of genes has definitely improved since then. I totally agree with the article of Biju George that was circulated in our group some time back. Whether or not homosexuality is genetically predetermined, the interesting biblical take on the genetic nature of all sin is that we are born with original sin. The double talk that we hear from the world is that we can be established as genetic son. What can be established as genetic somehow becomes permissible in society. Suppose we were to discover in future a gene that makes a person a kleptomaniac. Would it make shoplifting permissible? One of the joys of reading the Bible is to discover that the truths of God are not counterintuitive. We Indian Christians should craft metaphors through which we can speak to our fellow humans in our land. Finally, the church in India have to get our act together. We need to truly be the conscience of our nation, and that will never be accomplished by shouting from the housetop on isolated issues like homosexuality. That is also not going to be achieved by throwing stones at courts and governments. If the world is floundering in darkness, who is to be blamed? The light, is it not? If the world is losing its state and is beginning to rot at the core, who is to be blamed? The salt, is it not? Thank you very much.